just to let you know, I am Travis Keys. I am chairman of American Photographic Artists New York. Uh, we are a national organization. Uh, some of you are members and those of you are not welcome and thank you for uh, attending today. Um, we are a at our heart photographers looking out for photographers. Um, we're an advocacy group. We are uh, a benefit group. We are out there to help people become more successful at what they do uh, by education, networking, and uh, just looking out for one another, mainly. Uh, it's a beautiful community. And right now, uh, I think the most important thing is that we look out for each other and we protect each other and we give share information because sharing information is gonna make us a lot stronger and uh, it, it allows us to really have the tools to go into negotiations and, and different situations and come out on top. What's uh, been some of the, uh, for you, Lou, uh, are you a, a member of any organizations? Yes, yes, I've been. I actually, you're too young to remember, <laughs> but I was there in the formation of APA. So oh, fantastic. Meetings that happened way back in New York. I was yeah. an original member, yeah. initial member, uh, et cetera, et cetera. It was a long time ago. When they were known as advertising photographic. That's artists. right. That's yes. right. Exactly. Yeah. But, and then I've been on board the board of directors of the ASMP for a long time, again, years ago. And now I'm on the board of directors of the ASMP foundation. Awesome. Awesome. Uh, so people are not having a, I see someone asked about the Q and a panel. Did you have a problem uh, clicking on it and that it wasn't letting you uh, type? Uh... Yeah, I don't think it's letting, uh, I don't see this, the thing where it's letting people type. All right. Well, uh, hopefully uh, then just throw your, uh, if, it, if it's not working, then we'll use the chat panel. Uh, so you can throw your, I will watch the chat panel for you guys. All right. So um, with that, I'm going to say hello to everyone. Thanks for coming. And uh, Deborah is going to introduce our wonderful guest. And uh, Deborah, why don't you take it from here? Hey, everybody. Welcome. Uh, I first met Lou Jones many years ago uh, when I was picture editor at Image Bank, which was at the time, the world's largest stock photography agency. Now it's called Getty Images. <laughs> um, but uh, Lou Jones has had an eclectic career and it's evolved uh, from commercial to the personal. It spanned every format, film type, artistic movement and tech technological change. He maintains a studio in Boston, Massachusetts and he's photographed for Fortune 500 corporations, international companies and local small businesses, including FedEx, Nike, um, and the Bar Foundation. He's completed assignments for magazines and publishers all over the world, uh, such as Time, Life, National Geographic, Paris Match. He's initiated long-term projects on civil wars in Central America, on death row, the Olympic games and pregnancy and produced multiple books. And now um, his most recent project is the Pan-Africa Project that he's gonna talk about a, a lot of tonight. Um, the project itself, putting the project together and putting together a successful Kickstarter to fund it and the production of the first volume will be a multi-volume uh, book of books published. And the first one is out. And um, uh, he's gonna be talking all about that. So we're really honored that uh, uh, he's here today. So. Take it away, Lou. Q and A panel is working. Someone sent in a test, so it works fine. Okay. Okay. Well, thank you, thank you, thank you. This is a, a tremendous opportunity. You know, being able to put our photographs in front of such august uh, crowd of people, my colleagues, my you know, my peers, is a tremendous, tremendous effort. You know, not only uh, the fact that I'm able to share something that's really ongoing, which is the Pan-Africa project, but a little bit of my career. And I'm gonna, I'm gonna start there. I'm gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna sh start sharing screen. You don't need to see me. Um, and I'm gonna go right away to uh, some photographs. I'm gonna start, I'm gonna start way back, you know, on the log cabin. I was born in a log cabin in Illinois in the 1800s. And, but this is a website and I'm gonna, I'm gonna sort of, go through, let me see. Uh, yes, so we're talking about uh, uh, images, commercial images for clients. You know, this is, a, this, is, this is the kind of thing we, were, we, we have been known for, which we really do press 
These are huge assignments. This is in Anchorage, Alaska for FedEx a few years ago. And, um, you know, we bring lots and lots of lighting up to Anchorage, Alaska. They didn't have any. We had to rent it in Chicago. But um, we go and the annual reports that we do, uh, this is done for Aetna. This is the project we did as an annual report for um, a major agency here in Massachusetts. And uh, it's the kind of thing that we became well known for, which was hopefully stretching the boundaries of what is considered con commercial photography and uh, this client control this bridge. So um, I convinced them uh, after signing my life away to let me up on up on the bridge, which was, uh, uh, I had to sign my life away, as I said. But you can see more and more of these uh, kind of things. I'm gonna go to a little bit of editorial. Deborah mentioned that I have worked for virtually every uh, magazine that you can imagine. And, uh, for a number of years, and, and, and I'm hoping that, that it's continuing. We have been, I'm going a little too fast, I think, a little too fast, sorry, sorry. Um, but uh, the idea, we have been continuing to photograph the Olympics. And this was not, one, not the first, but one of the first of the major, and it's been going on for over well over 20 years. I've photographed as of now 13 Olympic games. This was uh, Brazil, this was uh, Rio. And I learned a lot through this talking about long-term projects. And I'm gonna really go through a lot of material and people can ask questions as they go, but I'm gonna go through a lot of material as to how I went from commercial to uh, doing these long-term projects. And the Olympics is not something that I could have planned 20 plus years ago. I started getting clients photographing the Olympics. And then as I got more and more Olympics, I realized that I had something, and I'm, talk a lot to people about long-term. I had something where I could actually start to look at the body of work of several Olympics that I had photographed as a cohesive continuing project that every four years, every two years, when you start to think about winter and summer, I do both winter and summer games. And so it became a major, major, and we exhibit the work, et cetera, et cetera. Let's see if I can go through a few others. Um, this is a long, this is part of a long-term project where I'm photographing construction. Now, lots of people photo, but we do it a lot differently. We're, we're photographing really very close up all the time. We're spending a lot of time on construction sites, but I'm gonna go to some, let's see. Yeah, let's go to something a little bit more eclectic. We started photographing and I got the idea for a, what I thought a very short term project, photographing men and women on death rows. I thought I would go and photograph two or three people and have a real body of work that was really compelling, really relevant started with an argument I had with my father over the death penalty when I was very, very, very young. And then it presented itself as a much larger thing as I got older and got the idea. Again, I thought it would start with just a few, but it took six years. It's impossible. And that's a lot of what we're going to talk about in terms of these long-term projects. It's impossible to photograph on death rows, on death row, period, plural, singular and plural. 
So it took a long time and it took a lot of thinking and designing. And here's, here's the 27 people over six years, took another year to write the first book. There have been two editions of the book. Uh, and we photographed every one of them face to face. They call it contact visits, which we were told by several of the prisons that you couldn't do. You had to photograph, if, if they were gonna allow us in at all, we had to photograph through some kind of barrier, uh, wire mesh, glass, et cetera, et cetera. But every one of these people. So we ended up in Lincoln, Nebraska. Um, I claim that I hold the Guinness Book of World Records for holding my breath. Me and my assistant got up early in the morning and I held my breath driving to from the motel to the prison for the first time. I had never, I'd been in prisons often, but I'd never been on a course on death row. Couldn't believe how long it took us to get permission from this man to get into the prison. And I held my breath for the drive there, going through security, the entire time I photographed him and driving back to the motel that we were staying at. So I think I, held, I again, I held the Guinness Book of World Records. We photographed all 27 face to face and we solved a lot of problems of how to get in, uh, making the project really compelling in terms of never lying. I have had other people who have gone into prisons and talk to prisoners, but almost invariably, they lie to the prisoner and they're compelled, I guess they think so, because they have a deadline. They have to be on the news at 11 o'clock that night. We had the, I won't say convenience, but we had the luxury of not having a deadline. It was a personal project. So we were able to, to delve into this uh, in ways. Here's, I'm gonna go back to some of the other, um, uh, we photographed men and women. This is one of two women that we photographed. Uh, she was able to negotiate herself off of death row and uh, very, very, very compelling story about what she did in order to get herself onto, and there are very, very few women that have received the death penalty throughout history in terms of uh, the, the current jurisprudence and, and our systems. So we worked very hard to make sure that we included women. And let's see. And we photographed in Texas. And I was sort of, sort of like, able to snub my nose at Texas a few years ago when I was able to exhibit the entire project in the state of Texas, which was to, I was told that although I had gotten into other death rows, I would never been a, be able to get onto Texas. And not only did we get into Texas, but as you see here, we photographed, I think we photographed like six or seven people over three different trips in Texas. And this really started to form the idea of what a long-term project is. And we say long-term, and that's not a bad thing. In point of fact, as a photographers who are always saying, what can I do to make, to give myself relevancy I didn't want to be known as just the photographer who had the cover of an annual report of a computer. And when they put the pennies on my eyes, I wanted something, I, I wanted to change the world with my photography. So I'm sure a lot of you 
have similar thoughts and already have bodies of work. You, 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 you photograph kumquats and have been doing that for many years and you have a, a really relevant body of work. You can go back and look at that work or you can start something absolutely new. This, is, uh, this goes on and uh, shows a lot of details about uh, state by state, who has the death penalty, who doesn't, who, who commits the most executions. And this, if you look at the bottom of the screen, you can actually see me and um, at that time was my rep. She went into several of the death rows and did the, once we got in, as I said, time really becomes an asset. Not only financially, because you can stretch the monies often that these things are very expensive sometimes, you can stretch that out so that your, 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 your pocketbook can be helped. And we'll talk about finances a little later. But also, what you're thinking about when you start these projects may be very different from what you find years later. They evolve. And one of the things was I went in with an assistant and started photographing, but the stories, as bad as these people were, the stories were unbelievable. And I said, I can't walk and chew gum at the same time. So concentrating on taking good pictures. So I decided to take my rep in. The first picture here is us in Connecticut, which no longer has, has, has rescinded the death penalty. And the other one is in Texas and is uh, one of the pictures. So now I'm going to see, see where we go from here. Let's go to let's see. Okay. And this is a long-term project that I convinced a client to fund, which is photographing on construction sites. And the client pays for pays me to do this on a regular basis and pays for the website. And it resulted in exhibitions and a book at the end of the first project. And this is the second project. So you can see, this was the first photograph after they were allowed us back onto the site covered. But you can see the kind of photography, but this was really a client based project, which was, which has really, really, really become very, 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 very nice. Okay, let's go to oh, where are we? At? Where are we? Oh, here we are. To the one that Deborah talked about. And this is Pan Africa project. And this, as a result of what I learned doing the, the death row, what I learned doing the construction and what I learned doing jazz and all of these other things has become the new project, we started it about, now I had this idea 20 years ago, but just like some of the people that are coming to me to talk about long-term projects, I had no idea how to do this in the beginning. It took years for me to figure out how to do this. And again, instead of going out and spending a month photographing like I might do for National Geographic, this has stretched over a long period of time and the idea is to photograph all 54 countries in Africa 
one by one. We go for extended periods of time and we're trying to dispel the misconceptions of what we are taught in school, what our media tells us about what's going on in Africa, which is always neo-colonial, negative, terrible, terrible news. It's really a way of trying to control the message that's coming out of Africa in order to, to be to repress what's going on there. And so this is us trying to photograph the progress, the contemporary life, modern day life in Africa. So we're doing religion and recreation. We're doing all kinds of things. We're doing industry, education, we try to do this in almost every country. And a lot of the things I'm saying to you are problematic because when you go to another continent, when you go to another culture, and when it's so diverse as, as when you are in Africa and you're literally going country by country, which each one of them is unique, each one of them is special, when we talk about industry, when we talk about education, it is a very different. And so the long term of learning how to deal with this is really, so you see, see we're dealing with sports, we're dealing with, Africa is becoming the breadbasket of the world. So you're seeing here that they're producing wines and things like that. So we've created this website, which we use as not only a marketing tool, but also a vehicle for being able to talk to people that we're trying to insinuate ourselves into their lives. And these are all different, but up we have done to date, we have done uh, 14 countries of the 54. Some mathematician told me that's a something like a 30%, 25%, something like that. Anyway, they're the fastest growing economies. And we're trying to bring this kind of this kind of information so that the schools that taught me that everything there was primitive, everything there was negative, we're trying to show their economies, what they're doing. All right, I'm going to go back up here and deal with this. So we've created, so you can see here, this is the map we've got. We're going to go to the bigger map. And we're talking to people about where we are. You can see the red is where we have been. The green is the last country we were in, that was, that's Gabon. This is Gabon. We had this map de developed by for, specifically for us. And you can go over and see the different countries, where we've been, where we're going. And we're listening. So if you go, let's see, how does this work? Each country that we've been to has its own page. So if a student wants, if somebody would approach this and they have a singular idea, that's what developing this website, they have a singular idea. They don't care about our project. You don't care about our project. But if you wanted to know something about a specific topic, about a specific country, you can go and you can see images from Ghana. We've developed our own maps. Etc. Let's see, there's another, let's see if we can go back to another country. Namibia. And you see, we've developed 
with the death row project, with the Olympics, an algorithm that allows us to figure out where the next country that we're gonna go to is, and this is Namibia. So we talk about history and how Namibia, but we also talk about these parallel cultures. You see here this, this tribal situation. I was gonna go back here. Again, this map is very different from the others. They're all, the maps are all created by artists. We talk about resources. We talk about natural situations. This is the Kalagar, Kalahari Desert. This is commerce. This is a grocery store with, and at the same time, this parallel thing that we know, downtown in this particular case, Namibia, Windhoek is the name of the capital, looks just like downtown Cleveland. It's amazing. And this, so this is the kind of thing, grocery stores and schools, etc., And parallel, which is very different, we have these indigenous populations. So we have to photograph, find them, and insinuate ourselves into both, get into the indus industrial situations. This is, this is Namibia Airlines, Air Namibia actually. And we were able to convince to get not only into the into the uh, airport, but also into the cockpit of one of the airlines. We're photographing media, TV, etc. This is a newspaper. Let's go back up and see if we can. And I'm going to get into some of the stuff. While you're, while you're looking at that, someone wanted to know when you travel to these countries, how large a crew are you traveling with? Oh, good point. Good point. Um, usually, I have at least one assistant, often two, and then I pick up a local person who can be at least one local person, sometimes two. They can be driver, translator, and fixer. And we have to have, because very often negotiations are in, in so we, we have, I've had as many as one, two, three, four, five people in a van going out into, and that was in, uh, where was that? That was in, I think that was in uh, Namibia. Actually, we, we actually had five people. No, it wasn't, it was Ethiopia. I take it back, take it back. It was Ethiopia that we had five, five different people that Ethiopia is over here. So I'm going to do one more country and then I'll start dealing with some of the other uh, components. Each one of these countries gets its own website, as I said, and we're dealing with the issues that are unique, languages. That's a big problem. Language is a really big problem with with what we have to do. And here we had this map created and we got into real trouble with this because the UN map is what you're seeing sort of like, this is the UN map. You see Western Sahara, Morocco, but Morocco considers both these places Morocco and they've been fighting over it for years. And we got into real trouble because we showed using our website, someone we were in Morocco to try to convince them to let us photograph their, their institution. They were very, very angry with us. So we're dealing with a lot of these, these kinds of very complex cultural issues. Hospitals, we're photographing the unique situation, which we have in this country to some degree, but in Africa, it is really traditional medicines, uh, holistic medicines, which doctory are sometimes more important to the populations than our traditional, our contemporary 
So we're, we photographed in lots and lots of hospitals. And then we have these very, very, these portfolios. Each country has a portfolio. So someone can go to the website and look at the portfolio and it's searchable. They can go and see other pictures that you don't even see here. So if you wanna find healthcare, we had a woman who, who came to us and really stretched us out recently, who wanted to look at just women's healthcare, not in a country, but in all countries. So we had to pay someone to, to develop that software for us, but we're photographing in, uh, in hospitals. This is a major hospital in, I believe it's in Casa, Casablanca. Uh, this is a university, physics department at a university. And we're going in it and we're taking lighting. So we're shooting. I wrote a book years ago on speed lights. So I'm traveling now. I be te I'm teaching a um, workshop, online workshop this for, for photo uh, professional photographers of America this weekend on speed lights. But we carry a fairly large kit of speed lights. I'm gonna see if there's we do a lot of uh, here we go. So this is this is this is uh, Casablanca. So we're convincing hotels and big places to let us up on the roof during days to be able to give people an overview of what it looks like and things like that. And I'm gonna go back and see if we can get back. Back, 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 back. Is it gonna do it for me? No, it's not going back for me. Here, well, let's do it this way. Here we go. So we're very proud of that. Like I said, we've done 14 countries so far, but this is something we're really, really proud of. Now we're developing this for educational purposes, for commercial purposes, for clients that might be wanting to visit a country and see what the country, they, they might be getting transferred there by their company or somebody might want to know some, again, about healthcare or farming, agriculture, um, all, all of these issues. So somebody can go to the website and find many of these photographs, but the photographs, if you go on Google and photograph Dar es Salaam, which is a major city in Africa. Photographs are horrific. And that's on purpose. That really is on purpose. But this is something that we are very proud of. We've developed, we erased all the lines because we were finding that we were getting these parallel communities. Contemporary people with coats and ties, driving their Mercedes and driving their uh, Volvos around town to go to work, taking their kids to school, et cetera, et cetera. But at the same time, we had these, these indigenous populations, what we used to call tribes, that were by all educational uses, we say in the United States, this is primitive. Whereas these cultures are maintaining these traditional ways of life on purpose to continue the way that they have, their cultures have grown up for hundreds of years so that they're two parallel situations. So we decided that since colonial lines were dividing this up into 54 countries. We got rid of all the lines. So we, we went back and we, up in, up in the Morocco and Algeria, we've got the Berbers. We, and we have photographed, we photographed these different tribes. You see the Ashanti down here in, uh, in, 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 in uh, Ghana. You saw the, Himba and Herrera in, 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 so you could actually click on the tribe and go and see what they look like. Both in schools, dressed up, 
et cetera, et cetera. It's really very, very, very. But this is, instead of calling it Mali, we're calling it Tuareg. And we go places like, uh, instead of calling it Tanzania, you can actually see what the Maasai tribe looks like, etc. Now, Deborah wanted me to talk about how we're funding a lot of this. I'm going to go back. And so we have, we, we sent in, last week, we applied for another grant. We apply for grants, artistic grants, and cultural grants. But the largest amount of money that we have raised, and this is something that really, really, really has opened up all kinds of new things, especially for long-term projects. Even though it wasn't designed for this, and we'll tell you how we used it, is crowdfunding, how to raise money. So the computer has brought in this method of being able to raise money for all kinds of things. You want to develop a digital online game, or you want to make a new kind of tripod, but you need, you need funding for research. You need to work on some new software or an app. Uh, you, you need to, you need to publish a book. You need something that's for inventors, artists, people with vision. We're now able to control our own destiny financially as well. So we used Kickstarter and we did two campaigns. We've done two Kickstarter campaigns just for Pan-Africa, two different ones probably about two years apart. And we raised substantial money and um, most people are working on a product. You know, I think, uh, I think there's a, a couple of camera companies, not camera companies, but camera product companies that have raised most of their money using a Kickstarter campaign, crowdfunding, and you get, at the end of it, you get a camera strap or a, some kind of doodah that you can attach to your camera and people, a, a, a tripod, a new kind of tripod where they're developed. That's sort of how these campaigns have been developed. You've got an idea, you've either got it in the works already and you need funding to complete it or you want the money to develop it, et cetera, et cetera. You want the software, you get a game for your computer or whatever it is. At the end of the period, you get the game. That's the, the reason you're sending the money. Well, we are used a completely different methodology. We needed to raise money but the money was needed to take a trip, to actually fund a trip. Actually, we funded three trips now with Kickstarter. And we used, we talked to a lot of people and Kickstarter is really amazing. They have all this information. They have every kind of metric that you can imagine. How long you're supposed to do this for, when you're supposed to talk to people, who you're supposed to, what kind of all, everything you can imagine, they have already there for you to look at, go online and to mount your own campaign. It's really, really, really meticulous. Things like, um, the fact that the, 
if you do a successful Kickstarter campaign, you're infinitely more likely to be able to do a second successful Kickstarter campaign. And they show you the percentages. And that's why I did two. Um, it tells you when to send out new messages. It, it shows you the graphic of where your money is coming from. It, all kinds of things like that. And it's really very important. And one of the things that we designed it around, and like I said, ours was very different, was that we used, I don't know if you can see, uh, let me stop sharing. Let me stop sharing so that you can see me. Can you see me now? Yes, we can. Okay. So we did completely differently than most people do. We said, that one of the rewards for giving us money for the second Kickstarter campaign was that you were paying for a book. So this was one of the major things. Now, we were asking people to pay for a trip and pay for a book, both sight unseen. And that was where ours was very, 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 very different, different from most people. But we got the first book published. It was published actually, it was finally published during uh, uh, the beginning of COVID. And that was really problematic because we finally got it designed and all ready to go and we're ready. We sent it to the printer and COVID came in and shut the printing plant down. It was like, I couldn't believe how is COVID being an international disaster it was also getting a personal disaster that was coming along with it. So, but we have a book and you can go on the website and see it, but we used the fact that you got a book or print. Some people, we had very small little, uh, little things that were very inexpensive. So people could go on and get something. If all they had was $25, uh, we sold a number of portfolios. We actually, that was the big one. I think that was $500. I'm, I'm, I'm blanking. It was over a year ago that we did. So a quick question just to, to um, kind of, uh, get this all on, on the same page. Basically, you were doing as an incentive uh, funding your trip, not a trip. It, was, it wasn't a trip for them. It was funding your trip. And also, they, they could receive a book as one of the incentives of the Kickstarter, correct? For yes, different price I was funding, investment levels? That's right. I was funding the next trip in the, in the Pan-Africa project. And, and a question that some people had is this, uh, pro this project seems like a very educational uh, effort. Uh, who was the intended audience and who were you targeting uh, for this? Okay, good, good point. Most of you, anybody, I don't know if anybody knows me, but I've been doing this a long, 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 long time. So in my career, as Deborah said, we have investigated so many. So we've, we've published lots and lots of books. Um, and we exhibit. So we were hitting, using, because we were putting so much effort into this project, we wanted to be able to hit all of those, check off all those boxes. So we exhibit in museums and galleries. We published a book. Um, and we are using the photographs for educational purposes. Now, again, that's very complicated because we're in conversation with several African publishers who use our photographs for articles. So we distribute them in that way. We lecture, we do a lot of lectures. I'm doing one uh, in about, Another one in about, I've done, just during COVID, I've probably done 10 lectures during COVID, just on Pan-Africa. And we also have some of the work in stock. 
So we're actually trying to make the project self-sustainable, if that makes any sense. In order to be able to do this, we are using the Kickstarters, crowdfunding to support it during the middle eras. And then we're hoping to use that device. We're writing a grant right now in order to be able to utilize the fact that this is an ongoing project. We're not going to this grantee to say, hey, give me a lot of money sight unseen. This project is ongoing. It's viable. We have it going. You can see the results. And it's a known commodity. What we need to do is to be able to have your money to expand it, to give it a farther and farther reach. Did I answer any of your questions with that? No, absolutely. And I think uh, one of the one, things that I'm curious about, I'm sure some of the other people are, is is where does it really start, especially on this project? Where where was the inception or the, the kickoff idea? Was it something that you had or they came to you? Or where, where does it actually, like, this is a huge project. And, and was it was just something like... I want to do this, or you went to and met with people, or they approached you. And when you're launching your first Kickstarter, it, where do you get the, you know, the the incentives and the ideas to launch something like that? And the idea is it like say the book, you know, it's like are you launching the book at a certain price? Is it limited? Is it uh, can you buy it after the fact that for more money? It's like what are the how so how, from the inception where does it start and how do you get into those kind of details? So we, you, you're, you ask a lot of very good questions. One of the things, I'll start with the book. Yeah. The book was an incentive to get people to pay, but we overprinted a relatively small run. I think probably only a couple of thousand copies. All right. So it's, the, it's an expensive book. The book is was a certain price on Kickstarter. Mm -hmm. And we are holding that price solid. At some juncture, we may drop it a little bit, but it will more than likely go up a little bit. All right. In order to make sure that people who were Kickstarter don't, don't, are not being shortchanged. Right, later right. Down, okay. This is all stuff that we had to calculate. Um, so the, the book is, and it, and we are selling the book now. It's, you can go on the website. First thing you see is, you know, and there's books sitting over there that I have got to take to the post office tomorrow. All right. So we're selling the books in order to pay for future trips. And that was always the intent. So it wasn't just a limited edition. So we, the book was, we, Back in the day when I used to do the books just for publishers, it's pre-sold. They call that pre-sales. So the book was paid for before the first page was printed. The book was paid for. I didn't have to sell another book. All right? So, but we overprinted in order to be able to have an ongoing and also to provide us with the volume, again, the thinking was people were saying, oh, are you going to do a book? You're going to do a book? Are going to... Well, theoretically, if this doesn't, if COVID doesn't end soon, I'll be 106 before this, this project's finished. So the idea is that I was maybe 10 countries in by the, when people started to really pressure me for doing a book. And I went, oh man, I'm, I can't, I can't do, I, you know, it's going to be another, it's going to be another 10 years before I can do a book. So I went, oh, I'm not the smartest bulb out there. So I went, oh, wait a minute. If I do it in volume form, I can come out with another book every year that eventually will cover as far as I've gone in, in, in this project. Does that make sense? So that was always calculated that way. Yes. So, I mean, we're talking, I mean, what you're doing here is, 
is so many levels. And so you know, you're talking about putting a book together. You're probably talking about running a Kickstarter. You're talking about running logistics and languages in foreign countries. I mean, this is this is a huge, uh, you know, compilation of things together. Do you have someone that's running your Kickstarter or, or kind of you know, spear fronting that for you? Or do you have different teams kind of attacking different segments of, of the project? I have, I well, Pan-Africa has a advisory board. There are some Africans. I just added somebody new that I met. He actually came all the way from Ghana to visit me during COVID. He's on the board. I have one of the uh, heads of one of the colleges in Africa. I have uh, the head of a hospital in the United States. He's been very helpful with getting into hospitals around the world. So I have about eight or nine people on the advisory board. Then I have a staff and we work very lean. So I've always had a staff. So, and my tech, my tech assistant um, loves this kind of, he keeps the computers in the background all over and the cameras and everything all running. He loves that stuff. And he likes that kind of, so he was, we got together and we formulated and he's the guy that can read the metrics and understand what's going on. And so he kept it up. So I was the one that has spent 40 years developing a very good Rolodex. So clients, friends, subjects that I photographed, uh, you name it. I have always maintained a very, very, very um, dynamic Rolodex. So that's why I thought that I could do it in the first place. Uh, Kickstarter does not, you go on the Kickstarter, and a lot of people think you go and put Kickstarter and put your subject up on the thing and people just send you money. Nothing could be further from the truth. It is a lot of work and your 80-20 your rule, 80% of your money comes from your Rolodex. All right. So, so if, if someone say is, you know, it, it kind of just starting out and they're, 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 they're just the, 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 you know, that, that ember of wanting to start a long-term project and they don't have a full team yet. What are the, what would you suggest the first couple steps in, in engaging in that? What, what should they be doing? If like, all right, I know I want to do this long-term project, but I don't have any idea how to get started. What are the, the, the key fundamental things that they should really focus on in the, in the early stages if they're, if they only one or two people that are possibly doing it? Well, the, I know that this is not really answering the question the way you want me to. <laughs> That's life. <laughs> the world the, one of the things about we talk about long term projects is coming up with a good idea. I people call me to consult on their long term projects all the time and I go, you know, it's, it's been done. It's, um, it's not well thought out. And, you know, I think you can do better in terms of your idea. All right. So it starts with literally with coming up with a, un, a relatively unique, good idea. And then the next thing is, is that the world, unfortunately, wants you to compartmentalize it so well and so you, if you think these grandiose ideas, you need to really focus down on what it is that you do well, because you're going to do this for a while. If you're, I mean, even, a, even if it's only a month, but if it's going to take a year or two or whatever, you've got to really, really like the project in order to be able to. And then now I'm lying because I just said compartmentalize. Whereas we've been doing these projects long enough that we are trying to expand, We're, I'm lying, but the first few major projects really had a very focused, you know, idea. Shooting the Olympics, 
<laughs> you know, <laughs> I've got four years to get the next client. I've got two years to get the next hotel where I'm going to stay. Right. So I'm doing, you know, I've spent, so you're spending a lot of time on the phone trying to, there's a lot of research that goes into this. You can't believe the number of phone calls and emails I send out in order, but because we've been doing this for so long, we can start to put all these little extra things about we need to engage the African continent in the work that we are doing. It's not just for Americans, it's for, when we get off the plane in, in a new country in Africa, and we tell people what we're trying to do, they get it right away because they know that their PR is horrible. They've been fighting it for generations. They know how, how horrible Western media treats them. So as soon as I, you know, so I'm engaged, but I want them to also benefit from the photographs, from the being able to use. So I've done a number of lectures over there. I've lectured to business schools, to, um, to, uh, to regular classrooms and all kinds of things. It's, it's really, and they get it right away, you know? So they say, hey, would you, can you teach a class for us? You know, so I'll go and I'm, you know, I'm like, oh, I don't want to do that, but it's a, it's really giving back. It's this is what it's all about. This yeah. kind of communication. Yeah. Did uh, we never really kind of got the to the this answer actually uh, for this major idea, the Pan Africa Project? What was the inception of the idea? Was oh, it yeah, you, yeah. or was it someone coming to you? And how much did it change? And is there an end game? We'll start with the inception. I'll start with the first yeah. part. Where did the inception? Yeah. I was reading, and I, I, the closest I can come to, I think I was reading a New York Times newspaper article. This is 20 years ago, almost 20 years ago, where the African Union, which is the conglomerate of all the countries in Africa, they, they're sort of to talk about issues of the entire continent came together and at one time, this was years ago, wanted to censor Western media from their news because they knew that Western media was not doing them any favors. Not only that, it was now, you know, to get very political, talking about neo-colonial law colonialism, how we control business and trade and tourism to Africa by giving it a negative image that's done on purpose. You know, we threw you out. We have independence now and oh, but we want to get you back. So, okay, that's the political part. But they put an article that said that they were going to censor Western media's access to news in Africa. And, you know, coming up in America, censorship, censorship. Oh, that's a that's a four letter. That's a four letter word. You know, that's a oh, you can't. Oh, no, 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 no. You, and then I realized. They were probably right. Because of the treatment that they get. And I thought about it and thought about it and said, Jesus. What can I do to change that? It was an idea, it was just a boom. And it wasn't a light bulb that went off over my head because I, I was completely perplexed as to how to address this and thought about it and thought about it and thought about it. And I realized that I, as a photographer, have the universal language. We, as photographers, are in control of this amazing phenomenon, which has not only doesn't need translation between China and Argentina or America and, and uh, Sri Lanka, you can see the photograph and understand it most of the time right away. Universal language. 
imagery. And not only that, but we have this new device of social media and internet where in Google, where we're spreading this communication, we're showing this and the most successful important element is the image. I was in control of that. Yeah. So that's where the, the whole thing started. And is there an end game to this or is it something that's going to be a, always continuing updating or do you, it's like, as soon as I finish every country over in Africa, move on to the next one. I do. Yes. I move on to the next. Yes, exactly. And it goes on the website and eventually, hopefully there's a real compendium and they start to, one of the other things about the long-term project, and this is something we learned along the way is that the synergy of things as you're moving along, the end game is more and more and to get it more and more complex that it actually becomes. So now I'm in negotiation with African photographers to get them engaged so that I can show their photographs about subject matters that I will never maybe have access to and how they much more in depth. So we're, in, we're talking about, so, so I'm not gonna say it's perpetual motion, but it's snowballing. And I'm yeah. hoping to get it to a point where it, it has its own, like, it's, like I said, it's self-sustaining. I mean, this is such a huge, huge project that you're doing. And any one of the, you know, we could slice this up into different, you know, things, just uh, a webinar just on putting the book together, or a webinar That's just right. on, on the Kickstarter, or a webinar on, on uh, you know, uh, facilitating fixers over in, in language, you know, it's like, what are some of the greatest challenges in this project that you found uh, for yourself? Um, <laughs> do you want to really be really mundane about it? <laughs> It, the physicality is unbelievable. Yeah. You know, I train, I tr I've told people, I've told my students, I train for the Winter Olympics. I must train for six, seven, eight months to be able to photograph in cold weather and to climb mountains. I train all, not quite as hard, but almost as hard to, in order to go to another country. And the physicality of for a month, all you're doing is taking, and I mean, you know, negotiating. I don't know about you, but that takes, that is taxing. Yeah. And then going and photographing and not just photographing, really kicking ass with photographs in different places. You know, I mean, you know, photographing automobile factories and, uh, um, and uh, mines and, uh, you know, and being able to come back with not just the photograph of that. And that's what you see on Google. You see a picture of a street in Dar es Salaam, as I was saying, that's what that I went before I went to, 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 to Tanzania, I, I typed in Dar es Salaam to see what I was going to see when I got off the plane. It was dreadful, <laughs> dreadful. And so I go, ah, oh, this is part of the, this is part of the, of the depressing thing that they try to, and so I'm trying to get pictures that will make people want to be there. Yeah. And, and, and someone actually uh, is followed up on a question. You're making pictures of, you know, that people want to be there. And someone said, I am from there. Did you mention that pictures of uh, Dar es Salaam were not good? Is that intentional? And why is that intentional? Again, what happens is, is that, and, and again, you don't want to hear the politics, but what happens is that Western powers, and we're talking America and South America and Australia, you know, all of China, a major component of, were kicked out of Africa, you know, These countries are now independent. The Western powers have been raping Africa 
of their resources when they were when they were colonializing that's what the whole thing was about they stole the gold the diamonds the oil the and now they have to pay for it so what happens is is that in order to be able to control this is a little too political i'm sure for you guys but well, someone's already mentioning spot on <laughs> <laughs> yes so what happens is, is they give an image and that's what that's what was happening with the african union we cannot allow this they only deal with three issues on the front page of the newspapers Con pestilence poverty and conflict that's all you ever see so what happens is, is if you can if you continually convince people that this that this continent is irredeemable people will start to believe it somebody gave me the best line this was quite a while ago but somebody gave me the best line our educational to our educational system africa is a cartoon tarzan lion king all of those cartoons that we you know that's you know this kind of oh, jungles and things like that you know nothing could be farther from the truth it's the the sixth fastest growing economies in the world are in africa so I want to ask the question, why such a commercial romantic outlook on Africa? And I, for me, romantic. Yeah. They, they said, uh, for commercial, but I want to add to that. It's like, commercial? It, yeah, that, that's I'm, so I want, uh, maybe so the person can, can clarify that, but I, I think, well, why not a romantic outlook? What is it like? I've been all over the world and I've traveled all over the world. Africa, I've only been there once for 10 days. And it was one of the most incredible places I've ever been in my life. There's nothing that has ever duplicated something like that. And for you to have this repetitive connection and now, you know, serious community and roots and people there, what is it like for you every time you go there? And what, is it, what does it mean to you? Well, um, it has become <laughs> this. Now, you have to remember that the algorithm where we choose, there's 54, it's got more countries than any other continent in the world. There's 54 countries, and they're so, each one of them has its own unique personality. You know, this country speaks French, this country speaks English. Yeah. This country speaks Swahili. This country, you know, it's like, so going there and as a photographer, I'm gonna talk a little bit more personally. First, as a, just a person, the amazing new aspects of how this part of the world lives on a day-to-day -day basis is just you know, I think, was it somebody like Mark Twain says the travel is the most educational thing that you can possibly do or somebody, somebody like that says yeah. that. Well, I'm so interested just as a person. And then you ask, what's the end game? I have created a project of continually taking new pictures that are surprising me all the time, possibly to the end of my life. Yeah. I've created a project that will just continue to stimulate me. So Africa, it's just, and as a matter of fact, I remember a couple of countries ago, I was like kind of getting the heebie-jeebies. I gotta get back over there. I, I gotta, you know, it was like a calling you know, this kind of thirst for seeing something new, something, you know, and as you, you did sort of tap on it about engaging and getting into these new places, which is really hard to do. And, but this is all stuff I've learned throughout a career. Right. Out of convince, how do you get onto death row and convince a death row inmate to let you photograph them. Skills that we've learned along the way. Yeah. 
uh, people I want to know, we're going to be wrapping up pretty soon. So if you have any last questions, please get them here. Uh, a question for you, if someone that uh, has wants to start their very first long term project, what would be the first three bits of advice you would give them? So all right, if you're going to start this tomorrow, here's three things that I want you to take away from this. Um, good one. Um... First one is do it. I know that that's a, <laughs> a stupid thing, but fear yeah. is the most destructive element to an artist and a photographer. And the fear can come in all different forms. The fear comes in, I've got to go to Africa and I'm afraid of, you know, are people going to eat me or are, are people going to, Kidnap me. I had a head of a, 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 a guy who I mentored, you know, was talking about, oh, they're going to kidnap me. I'm, I'm like, what, why did you get that? You know, uh, so fear, fear of taking pictures of a new culture where you don't know what, you know, fear of what you're going to eat. I've had people say, I can't go because I can't speak the language. Fear. Yeah. Fear. You can't. Okay. Um, the second is you can't bundle, and this is a big thing that we do in this country, you can't bundle a new idea into your old way of thinking. That's where we, I mean, and that's why we get such cliched photographs throughout, you know, we just constantly see these, these oh, horrible, horrible, you know, I did the death row book and I had somebody call me a big, big institution in Washington saying, we want to use some of your pictures for a convention. We, we need, want to use some of your death row pictures. And she said, Blah, blah, blah. And she did, she, but she didn't want to pay for the photographs. I said, did you know how much this thing cost me to do? And you, you you want a photograph of somebody on death row and you can't afford a few hundred dollars? Oh yeah, but you did it for a real charity. I said, no, no, I, it costs me money to do that. And she said, well, we have a, a designer that already has a photograph that she's gonna use. And so we go, I said, I said, yeah. I said, the cliches, I said, somebody with the two hands through the bars with a cigarette in it. She paid me my price. <laughs> Because <laughs> that's the photograph. So we have to think in terms of if you're going to approach a project, you got to get out of your comfort zone and really push the envelope. And the third is uh, don't listen to anybody. Naysayers. Why are you doing that? Why are you going over there? What, what are you, why are you starting that? Nobody wants to hear about that. That people... You can't believe the negative. I got an email today from somebody this morning. I said, he said, where are you going to go next? I talked to him a couple of days ago. I said, I'm, I'm going, I think I'm going to the Democratic Republic of the Congo. He sent me something about an Italian attache being kidnapped and killed. I just went, that's the crap that they put on the front page every day. That's the crap, you know, that... You know, he's saying, you can't go there. Ebola, <laughs> you know, that kind of stuff. So uh, how do you do your research? Because obviously when you're, you're doing, I mean, you, you talked about how even, you know, uh, several hundred miles is going to be a completely different experience. And to, you can be, you know, you can, the project can really be make it or break it just on finding a fixer a fixer can be right. you're, you're in on the language and make things happen that would never happen and, and you've been doing this long enough that i'm sure you're using you know resources and calls and and who you know but how do you initially start making these calls and and, and locating the right people to do the job i i don't this is this is it's a little bit of i don't use I don't say that. I rarely use information gathered here in the United States. You know, if you go to a wonderful college that may have a wonderful department on Africa, they teach about slavery. 
That's what they teach in class. That's important. But I, I want contemporary Africa. And in order to get that, I literally, the research, we do tons of research here. I have a file cabinet right over there that I've had for 20 years. I had an intern put it together 20 years ago where every time I see something of interest, I put a sticky or a, a, a post-it note or a, a cut the article out so that, okay, that is only the start. When I get off the plane, I'm writing a, a grant right now. I get off the plane. I explain to the, to the person I'm looking for money from here. I say, one of the things I do is we start having meetings and we start to talk to people about what is unique so that research starts here. But then I talk to people, I talk to you, I talk to everybody that's tuned in right now. Please go to the website. If you know anybody in Africa, if you've gone to school with them, if you've married them, if you've, if you've been there, any kind of interesting thing, please get, so it's six degrees of separation. So I hear somebody here, who tells me about somebody they went to school over there, who's now the, the minister of commerce. That is an infinitely more important connection than anything I will learn from Boston University or whatever it is. Okay, because they're giving me imprimatur to go and talk to that person who then says, okay, I'll open up, I'll let you come in here, I'll let you photograph my company because they have a connection. And that, so that kind of research, and it's really complicated because I'm developing, you know, I did a, I did a, uh, uh, I, phosphate is one of the biggest products of Morocco. It's one of the biggest, so I wanted to photograph phosphate. Morocco supplies the rest of the world with phosphate. Who the hell even knows what phosphate is? I call my alumni association to find from college because I wanted to find out who's working in phosphate and what the hell it is. And they were like, eh, 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 eh. We got over there. The first person that somebody told me about in phosphate, boom. They could tell me what it was, who to talk to, how to get into the place, boop, 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 boop. So, so much of re our research has to be done. Yeah, it's- <laughs> when, you, when you have this much information and research and, and, and everything that goes into it and all the logistics, how do you stay organized? I mean, how are you personally staying organized in all of this? Uh, it is, it's, it's a sort of a, a, a fun, like one, the first, the simplest way is that I have a, a, a file, you know, a, a manila, those old fashioned, put it in the, you know, yep. and I just cut out an article and put, it. and then I start, um, every country has an enormous file on the computer. And we talk about we talk about, like I said, uh, the, the biggest products because you need, Westerners need a structure. That's another breakdown in communication between there and here. People say, well, what are you going to do? And so I have to say, well, I'm photographing all aspects. Well, they say, no, 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 no. We need to know exactly. They, this other grant wants to know a weekly schedule. Like, how do, but anyway, they want to see industry, medicine, uh, culture, media, sports, all of those things are totally Western constructs. So the language changes over there. So the research and all of that becomes a whole, I have to talk, I'll tell you a quick story before you cut me off and everything. <laughs> uh, I was in Burkina Faso. And I had been in the capital, which is a Jeopardy question. Ouagadougou is the capital of Burkina Faso. 
And I had been photographing and people had been really good to me and taking me around. And I said, okay, now we need to get out of Burkina Faso. Where is the most, imp so somebody says, oh, you got to go to Bobo. I said, Bobo, I thought they were kidding me. I said, no, it's the name of the, Bobo, they don't say any, they don't give the full word of any city in Burkina Faso. So Wagadougou is just Waga and, and Bobo Dulasso is the name of this cultural capital. And I said, okay, let's, how do we get there? Oh, we can, and I said, how long, how far away is it? I was a physicist in school. So I know the theory of relativity. So somebody answered, oh, it's about six hours, not kilometers. Six, I said, okay, that's, that's I can, six hours, we can do that. And I said, okay, which way? And they went, oh, you just go towards Bobo. And I said, no, 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 north, south, east, west. These were college educated people. No idea. The, the, that was not part of their cultural language. They know how to get to Bobo. They can take me to Bobo. But for me to go north, south, east, west was not making any sense. Yeah. So these, everything is like that. There. Yeah. So if no one else has questions, I'm, I'm going to follow up with two last questions for you. When uh, something is so dependent on these images and what you get there and you're traveling so far to get them, how are you uh, backing up and uh, maintaining your assets when you're traveling? Okay. That, again, you asked, you, so many moving parts in this thing. I'm carrying a laptop. I'm carrying um, uh, backup. Portable drives? Huh? Portable hard drives? Hard drive. That's it. Thank, thank you. Uh, brain fart. <laughs> uh, but anyway, I'm carrying a laptop. More importantly, that's right. So we're doing that. So I'm downloading every day. I never erase the cards. Mm -hmm. So I got to take enough cards so that if everything goes and back up the hard drives, everything, I still got everything on the cards. Okay. Right. Then every night when I have Wi-Fi, I send at least two or three pictures to the, to that Rolodex I talked about to those people who have sent me money to get me there. So they're traveling with me. Gotcha. Seeing Africa in real time mm -hmm. using this thing so that the, the myth of what's going on is hopefully substantiated because they're seeing it as I'm seeing it, discovering it. And that part, so we're carrying laptop and hard drives and I uh, cell phone is like, in Africa, the cell phone is king. They have better, they, 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 you can buy a car with a cell phone. You can pay somebody's wages because they use this uh, cell money and everything like that. Much more. Oh, it's so true. I remember being in Africa and I was out with the Masamari and, uh, you know, that they're, you know, out there in their nutritional garb and the spears protecting the, you know, the, their livestock from lions. And I'm talking to them, I was like, oh, let me get your Instagram. And they pull out their phone and they, you know, it's like, and let me get a picture with you. It's, it's just, it's, it's unbelievable. Yeah. Um, so uh, an, another question for you. Let's see. Uh, let's see. Oh, no, that's great. Um, how do you have you embraced social media and how do you use it to kind of help in as what you're doing? Oh man, yes. As a matter of fact, I talk to people, I talk, yes. Um, social media has expanded, has, has extended my career by years. We use it constantly. Yeah. I mean, there are so many negative things about social media, but there are so many. We got money for the Kickstarter from halfway around the world, from people who I have never met. It has introduced this whole thing to a completely different audience. I have friends and Kickstarter from Africa that I never met because they're interested in the subject matter. So yes, we, we not only use it for commercial reasons, for the business of making a living of doing an annual report in 
St. Louis or, uh, you know, Oshkosh, whatever it is, we use the media for that, but we use it also to communicate with uh, people for all kinds of different reasons. And we're showing pictures constantly and it has really expanded my career immensely. That's amazing. I have two final questions for you. The first one, uh, I, I know going to Africa, it fundamentally changed me. How, how has been your trips there fundamentally changed you? Well, I'm, I'm a real, I've come to become less and I'm become more and more tolerant of people who have, I, I know this sounds so self-serving, but it really is not as self-serving as it may sound. I have become more and more tolerant of people around the world and people who have diametrically opposite ideas than I have and realizing that the cultures that I'm seeing are historically and contemporarily vibrant working ways of thinking and that and that has been in Africa incredibly life-changing because I'm seeing like I said I got over there to do contemporary Africa well that was a again a western construct when you get over there and you see these people in 500 year old costumes, living without water, without electricity, without sanitation, without all of these things that we think are impossible to live without. Now that's how, but they do it on purpose. They're, you know, and you go, so they, that was such, I just remember I walked into a appliance store, refrigerators and stoves and stuff. And this woman came to try to sell me a, a stove or whatever it was. I had my cameras hanging all over. And she said, she just turned to me and she said, what tribe are you? And I realized I was in a different world. And I just thought that was the best <laughs> world. So here's a question, my final question to you, which is I, I love to ask to my, my fellow soulmates in photography, uh, because you have chosen this as your profession. And I, I think all of us as photographers do it for many different reasons. So on the most personal level, what is photography to you? Two, two ways. It is as close as I have ever found to satisfying the eternal lust for new ideas and knowledge and, and, and experiences. I mean, photography puts me there. I've got to climb to the top of the, of the construction crane to take a photograph <laughs> and I can see the world. <laughs> I've got to go halfway around the world Photography is different from all other art forms because you gotta be there. You gotta, you, you gotta go to Alaska to get coal to shoot polar bears. <laughs> you gotta be, you gotta get shot at in wars to see to those experiences, learning what, re, what other people are experiencing. And um, the other is, I, I can't tell you how much I love making art. And photography allows me to do it thousands of times a day at 125th fifth of a second. <laughs> so, well, I'm, I'm glad you chose it as a profession and I'm glad that you spent this time with us. And I can't thank you enough for sharing, you know, your stories and your insight with us. Deborah, did you have anything uh, that you wanted to add off before we... Uh... No, I was just thinking at the very end, that's like the quote of the night. Photography is different from all other art forms because you've got to be there. That's like, <laughs> that belongs on a t-shirt or something. <laughs> that's, right, that's right. Somebody said they want to be in touch with me. I saw a little... A little thing. So, uh, uh, so how do people how do people follow up uh, and uh, check out your, your your projects that you're doing? Uh, you know, order books or help uh, help you finance the next trip or or just look at your work. 
Um, well, I'm my, my website is photojones.com. And that's with an F. F is in Frank. F-O-T-O-J-O-N-E-S dot com. Then I'm Pan Africa Project, one word, Pan Africa Project, one word dot com uh, dot org. And my email address, just like my website, is Photo Jones, F O T O J O N E S at AOL. I'm an old man. Dot com. <laughs> leave it, leave out the old man part, but you understand. <laughs> well, thank you so much. It's been an absolute pleasure talking with you today. And uh, I, I wish you the very best. And I can't wait to see the new images that come in from more, many more of your trips. And uh, thank you so much. Thank you. Thank I you. Just, you can't know how. Thank you, Deborah. <laughs> thank you, Lou. We so appreciate you. We're honored that you were here tonight. Thank you. Thank you. Take care. All my best to you. You got it.